And hello, this is Damon O'Brien, and you're so welcome to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And today we're going to talk about why lethal generosity can be an awesome strategy for speakers. And we have a terrific expert on uh, in our expert chair all the way over in San Francisco, one of my very favorite authors. It is Shell Israel. Shell, how are you? I'm fine. How are you, Eamon? Oh, I'm absolutely awesome. And for folks who don't know who you are, of course, you are a speaker. You are an author of many outstanding books. You're a fellow also who's been involved in the helping people to understand what technology can do from a business and from a personal perspective. And also a fellow who's been involved in PR and startups for, for many, many years. So you're a fellow who knows about launching ideas. Well, at least I've been around the block uh, enough times to make the block oval, so I've learned a thing or two along the way. Excellent, good. Well, I want to talk with you, of course, about your most recent book, which is called Lethal Generosity, which I know is um, a follow-up to The Age of Context, and I love the book, incidentally. And to ask you, why do business leaders today have to think about lethal generosity, and, and what is it? Well, yeah, let's start with what is it? Um, lethal generosity is the concept that uh, the better you are to your customers, the more loyal they will become, the more difficult it will be for them to be hijacked, the, the more you will be able to reduce traditional marketing costs and the greater profits you will have. Um, if you are nice enough to your customers in an experiential sort of way, the fact that the guy around the corner is offering one product one time at a lower cost might cost you a sale, but it will not lose your customer. They will stay loyal with you and they will become your champions, getting you more customers. Yeah, no, I think so. That's critically important. And of course, the truth is that the rules have kind of changed a little bit in recent years. And I was really struck by what you were talking about, about how the uh, sellers are no longer uh, in control. The buyers are getting to do that. Can you talk a little bit about that yeah. and, and, and why it matters? The, the, there's a power shift in bristling at a former misquote. Uh, I am not declaring that traditional marketing as we know it is dead, but I would suggest that the numbers show that they're tapering off. Marketers in the audience will immediately talk about how much better it is than broadcast marketing. But the point is that as the technology gets smaller, uh, we customers are just ignoring this stuff anyway. And as marketing tries to intrude upon us more, we customers are getting the tools to filter out their messages. So instead of listening to them, we're listening to your prior customers and we're listening to our friends. Yeah, and I think the listening bit is really critically important. And, and on that note, actually, I was uh, also hugely interested in the, 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 the comments and the observations you made about reaching out to millennials because oh, yeah. for many folks in the baby boomer side of things um and i'm i i know i've mentioned to you in previous conversation i was at, at a talk recently and one of the pro speakers said you know something when i go into a room now and the room is full of people who are under 30s i'm really not sure that i'm registering with these folks in the same way so maybe you could talk a little bit about if you like what is what is different about what's happening with the millennials and uh, what they react to and in fact who they trust there's a great deal different about millennials and i think it comes down to a single fact and that is they're the first generation of digital natives yeah um as digital natives they just have a natural integration with their mobile devices with technology in general uh, they use technology for shortcuts. They use technology for their source of information. Um, we did a, one of my book sponsors, Sail Through, did a study that confirmed what was found elsewhere. Uh, millennials in general don't trust leaders. They don't trust corporate uh, spokespeople. They don't trust uh, superstar athletes and movie stars. They trust each other. 
Um, they solve problems by using technology because they see themselves as nodes on a network, a network that we call the Internet of Things. Yeah, and I guess that's really changing the rules also, I suppose, in the, the, the fact that you can no longer present. You really need to get people involved in conversation. You have to invite people more into what's happening so that, that they're genuinely uh, hooked, they're engaged. As a speaker, you need to be engaged. As a speaker, you need to be someone that has something to share rather than uh, a bullet point to pontificate upon. Oh, I love that, yes. Well, I, I, and I'm a huge advocate of getting rid of bullet points in general because they're absolutely devoid of meaning. And in fact, as, get... a writer, as a writer, I find myself lost without them. As somebody who is twice the age of the oldest millennials and then some, uh, it is very hard for me to just share without trying to pretend to be one of the guys because I'm not. Um, to me, uh, the, the mobile phone was a really cool thing that got invented yesterday morning. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know about you, Shell, but I'm, I'm feeling down with the kids. I uh, did my very first Uber earlier on this year. Uh, I've been using Airbnb. So, yeah, I'm getting down with the kids. But actually... Well, well, let's talk about it. How was your experience in Uber compared to... A, you're in Dublin, right? Yeah, well, I'm in Dublin. I, I did this in America, and I have to say, and, and it actually ties back into something you were talking about, which is this notion of Uberizing experiences, that yeah. it upped the level of experience that I have because now I'm actually grading, and the driver who is driving me is grading me in terms of how did we get on. So it's a different dynamic. And uh, the Airbnb was the same thing. You almost are you're, you're worried about, well, I hope he thinks I'm all right. You know, <laughs> I, don't want, I, don't want, I, I don't want to dirty my bib on my first few goes of using Airbnb. We're, we're, we're starting to behave nicer because when we misbehave, it goes public. This is a yeah. new form of self-regulation that I really like. And if you want to have a rapport with millennials as an audience, as customers, as employees, as partners, then you really need to understand that, there, that your behavior is now public. When you do something that is, when you say something or do something that is stupid or inappropriate, it will be amplified when you do something that's particularly nice or good or useful or valuable it is also amplified um i i, I had an irish friend telling me that he now is very careful when he uses an uber in new york not to have suffered from the curse of the irish and have imbibed too much because if he pukes in the back seat of an uber he'll be back to the bloody taxi cabs <laughs> And it does make quite a difference. There, there is a significant difference in the price, but I also like the fact that the speed at which you can get a cab yeah. can, can be really um, pretty quick. And you don't have to listen to a dispatcher saying it's just around the corner. You see on your mobile app where that cab is, where that Uber car is, and you, you know exactly when, when they're going to pick you up. And you also know if they decide they're going to try to drive, as New York City drive, uh, cabbies are known to do, out of the way to ring up the cab, you can see it on your, your phone that this guy's taking you out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and exactly. You, you hit a quick thing saying, this guy's a crook. You hit another quick button and you say, no tip for, uh, for Bozo here, and you, and you get on with your life. Yeah, how funny, yeah. Well, I have to say that I really have enjoyed the experience, but actually from a speaker's perspective, I think there's some real mileage in thinking about that, not uh, intending any pun, because now that there is a greater experience um, expected and actually that will tend to occur in events when people are doing things on the internet and we, we, I was at a, a speaker conference over the weekend and even the speaker community they're getting really hip with the technology lots of people using Periscope which mm -hmm. meant that that the event was going live and there were people getting involved in the conversation although there are issues with it but the truth is that that's becoming more commonplace 
And so you are going more public more quickly and like it or not, you're going to be interacting more with folks. Periscope is one of many new technologies that's changing the speaker's business. Um, you don't get the three camera professional who's going to charge you a couple of grand to take you for 60 minutes and then you don't get the editor who's going to charge you a few hundred euro to take you one hour and boil it down to six minutes so you look good. Now that before you get off the stage, um, perhaps thousands of people will, uh, certainly more people than are often in the room, will know how good you were, how bad you were, and there is no longer you in control of that. Your audience is controlling that. Yeah, and, but, and interestingly, and I don't know where this, this rises and falls, necessarily as a speaker, if you're sharing something that's kind of your material and in past people might have been quite precious about that, these folks who are doing the, using the Periscope are commonly not asking for any permission, and there you go, your content is being shared. So that's an interesting one and maybe a, a, a separate topic for another day. I, I very quickly in that I don't know if European laws are the same a, a, as American here or Californians. In California, it's illegal for us to audio record someone without their permission, but it's absolutely legal to video record them. And this is getting very much into the law enforcement issues here. I, I don't know if that applies to speakers, but it's an interesting phenomenon that they, anybody can video record you here, whether you want to or not. Yeah, I, well, I, I think it's uh, the, 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 the truth is there probably is legislation on it. I'm guessing it's gray, but I'm sure it'll be revisited again and again and again. But, mm -hmm. but if I can kind of go back, if you like, to, to the, the meat and, 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 and so much of what really struck me as being interesting, within um, your book and I'm going to encourage people ag again and again and again to uh, absolutely get a hold of it. I was really struck by... Hold it, your... hold it. Hold yeah, it. We there have... it is. <laughs> okay, now we can get back to our regularly scheduled conversation. Yes, yes. <laughs> please do not adjust your search. We've just had a mini commercial, yeah. <laughs> But the, the power and importance of story, and I know this is something that you've been doing for forever, but it just struck me again and again and again in terms of helping people to understand and see why something applies to them. Tell me a little bit about why you use so many examples of stories in what you do. Well, one of the criticisms of my writing is that I don't have a lot of scientific data, and that's because... I'm not a scientific data kind of guy. I'm a speaker and I'm a writer. Primarily, I'm a writer. And a long time ago, from a speaking perspective, I looked at all the other people with bullet points on their slides, and I started using pictures and saying, this is Eamon O'Brien. He's an Irish guy. Let me tell you about Eamon. And I would tell a story that made a point in an anecdotal way. And I would let the audience decide whether that applied to them or not. Uh, my th reasoning is that usually most people can't remember the bullets on the slide five minutes after they've seen them. But there are stories that are told uh, 5,000 years ago that are being carried on and handed down today. So the power of a story for a speaker is just not questionable. And uh, while in certain circles it's now fashionable to have 3D graphics of flow charts and pie charts and pyramids and all the rest, a simple story well told will, in my opinion, drive a point home and make it more memorable for a very long period of time. Absolutely. And I think there's a broader thing too, Shell, and that is that not only do we remember these things and we enjoy them and what have you, but because people now need to be more involved than ever before and because they basically will have less tolerance, they've got to enjoy the experience a great deal more. And here's the yeah. bottom line. Stories are a heck of a lot more interesting than any number of facts and details you care to sh take a shake, a stick, to sh shake a stick at even. <laughs> That's a hard one to say without swearing even. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to have a glass of wine or two later on. I'm going to try that later <laughs> on. <laughs> you say it 10 times fast and you're in trouble. One more point about storytelling 
is that brings us back to millennials because when they see a speaker, they do expect you to be entertaining. That doesn't mean break out the straw brimmer and do a little dance, but you can't lecture a millennial audience. And if you think that you don't need millennials in your audience, they're now a, a majority of the world's global marketplace. And they're going to be that for the next 50 years. Um, why so long? Because they're having fewer babies. So their generation isn't going to be replaced. There's going to be a, 50 years from now, a bigger aging issue than there is for us old boomers. Um, yeah. But anybody who's looking to do whatever they're doing for the next three, five, or 10 years really needs to think of the millennial as their customer, as their audience, or anything else, as their employee, as their partner, and so on. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly right. And maybe we'll finish out on that because if you were giving advice to um, uh, yourself as a speaker, recognizing the changes that have happened, and you were saying, now listen, here's the one bit of advice that I would give you that would help you to be more connected with, if you like, those shifting sounds. What would be top of your list? Who? That's a tough one, Eamon. Yeah. Uh, something, mate. Um, <laughs> If you said the 10 things, I'd have it nailed. But um, yeah, I think I would boil it down to two words. Get real. Get real. Excellent. Shell, tell me about that. Get real means that while you need to be entertaining, you need to show who you are, what you have in common with the people in the audience and why they should spend their time looking at you and listening to you and remembering what you have to say rather than what their friends are saying on, on, on their mobile device while you're speaking. You may be in a room where you think you have them captivated, but half of them are going to have their faces in the screen and you don't know quite for certain just where their minds are at that moment. No, you're exactly right. I'm going to encourage people again to go and get a hold of a copy of your new book. It's an awesome read from stop to end, and there it is. <laughs> and Shell, can I thank you so much for joining me? It's been absolute joy. I, uh, as always, you're an awesome guest. And can I thank you also for watching today? You've been listening to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And until the next time, Happy speaking.